Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. And welcome to our Lunch and Learn with our Mental Health Spotlight, focusing on what our children are facing right now. What are they up against? And what are the resources, the tools that we have to support them as they transition back to on-campus learning and continue to navigate the uncertainty of COVID-19? So we're thrilled, honored to be here today to be able to offer an incredible group of experts to share their wisdom and resources with us. My name is Marnie Norris, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Programs for Inclusion Matters by Shane's Inspiration. And just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, everybody, all attendees will be on mute, but please put your questions into the chat. We will try to get to as many of them as we have time for after each panelist speaks. And if you want translation, we have a wonderful Spanish translator. Um, the instructions on how to access the translation function are in the chat in both English and Spanish. So thank you for being here. I'm going to hand it over to Tiffany Harris and Jane Park to introduce our session. Hello, everyone. We are so happy that you are here with us today and that you made time to join us for um, this topic that my, I really can't think of a more important topic um, at any time, but certainly at this time. And we are so extraordinarily grateful for our esteemed panel uh, that will be guiding us uh, through their expertise, their extraordinary expertise. So thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who are new to our organization, I'm Tiffany Harris. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Inclusion Matters by Shane's Inspiration. And we are are committed to creating inclusive playgrounds and education programs that unite children of all abilities. And as you can imagine during COVID, it has been a very difficult time as playgrounds and schools have been closed, which is really our primary source of programming. Uh, so we had to get very creative. And the silver lining is that we have really relied on our extraordinary partnerships to provide a, a year now of virtual programming, both for children and for parents and educators. And one of those partners really rises above them all. And that's too small to fail. And our partnership that is led by the amazing Jane Park. And through that partnership, we have been able to continue to provide such extraordinary impact this last year. So I'm very honored to introduce you, Jane, and very grateful for your partnership. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And thank you to the whole um, incredible Inclusion Matters by Shane's Inspiration team. You are truly inspirational and just all the work that you do to bring joy and um, inclusive uh, programs and environments to children, um, not just in the US, but all over the world. And on behalf of all of us at Too Small to Fail, um, we're the early childhood initiative of the Clinton Foundation. We just couldn't be uh, more grateful for just the work that you do and for our partnership over the past several years. Uh, over the, um, I think it's been about five years now, we have been working closely with the Inclusion Matters team to create literacy rich, inclusive playgrounds for children. We know how critical the early years are for brain development and, and, and for strengthening relationships between children and those who love and care for them. And much of this happens throughout just the daily moments they spend together, whether it's at the grocery store, on the bus, or um, at the laundromat, or at the playground. And at Too Small to Fail, we've been very focused on working with our incredible partners like in Inclusion Matters to really surround families with language and learning opportunities. Now we know over the past year, um, it's been incredibly challenging to say the least um, for, for so many families and um, so many of us, especially with, with little ones. And uh, we have been so inspired by just the stories of strength and resilience that um, families have shown educators um, therapists, authors, um, all of, uh, you know, we're so excited to have here today. 
and we um, we just want to celebrate parents today, educators, providers, anyone, as Fred Rogers would say, anyone who um, who helps a child is a hero to me. And um, you're all heroes in our eyes, and we just couldn't be more thankful to have you here um, and and feature our wonderful speakers uh, who uh, will. Uh, be sharing about uh, children and families' mental health and how to support them and in very concrete and tangible ways that I think all of us could benefit from when we were having these prep sessions. It's like, I'm going to do this today, <laughs> Dr. Frank Salian, you know, and, and Dr. Afana do. Um, so um, our hope is that we can all walk away with some very concrete and tangible strategies that um, all of us as educators, providers, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles can really use to um, uh, really strengthen relationships between children and families this time, during this time and support um, the mental health of children. Um, and, and Tiffany, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, there couldn't be a more critical time to be having this conversation. Um, so that said, uh, I am very delighted to introduce, oh, I think Marnie, go, yeah, I, I'll oh, hand sorry, it back over to Marnie. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so thank you, Marnie. Thank you, Tiffany, Marcy, and the whole Inclusion Matters team and all of our speakers here today. Thank you, Jane. We're honored by this partnership and honored to be here. Um, we are going to kick it off today with Donna Tetro. She is um, an, a parenting journalist and the um, host of Kids Under Construction, which is a fantastic podcast. If you can look it up, it covers a wide range of topics for parents, um, as well as educators. She's also an author of Dear Me, Letters to Myself for All of My Emotions, and a former teacher with Los Angeles Unified School District and a parent. So she has walked through the mental health challenges from a variety of perspectives. So I'm going to hand it off to Donna to kick us off. Thank you so much, Marnie, and thank you all. I'm so honored to be here. Really, really excited to be here. So I'm going to start off with a question. We're going to go dive deep into this real quick. I want to ask you, how are you feeling in this moment? You can just record it in your mind, or if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, how are you feeling right now in this moment? Are you feeling rushed that you had to get onto the Zoom? Are you worried about something? Are you happy? Um, I can tell you how I'm feeling right now. I'm so excited. I just got to finish my watching my son, sixth grade son, do his final presentation for the year. And I'm a little anxious because I'm speaking, right? <laughs> Who wouldn't be? So I have a couple emotions going on. So what is that emotion that you're feeling right now? Just lock that in. And identifying and recognizing our emotions, it's really a step in building our emotional intelligence, right? We know this. And so why is this so important? Well, the big picture is this. As parents and educators, we really focus on physical education, right? We've been doing this in the early years with our kids, nutrition, fitness. We build it into the home, into the curriculum at schools. But right now, more than ever, and even before the pandemic, we really need to focus on mental health ed for our little kids. We can teach them these strategies. We know that we can. It's research-based, evidence-based. We know we can do this. We can teach this in the schools and in the home as parents. And so when you think about the millions of teens and tweens who are diagnosed with mental health issues or disorders, we're reacting. We can be though proactive early on with teaching this skill set and doing this deep dive into learning about emotions in this emotional intelligence realm. So right now, lots of kids are going back to in-person school, right? They're having all kinds of emotions. They're anxious, they're lonely, they're fearful. I actually spoke to a little girl, third grader who, told me she's going to start school two and a half hours a day, but she said, I'm so scared. And I said, why? She said, because I don't wanna leave my mom. I don't wanna leave my mom. I've been with her for a year. I don't wanna leave her. I said, how else are you feeling? She said, I'm worried. I said, what are you worried about? She said, I'm worried about my grades. That's third grade. 
So thinking about that and all of these emotions that our kids are feeling, we really have to be cognizant and understand that we have to teach our kids how to manage their emotions. And we have to learn as parents and educators how to model that for our kids. And so I wanted to start off by showing you a slide um, from my picture book that I wrote during the pandemic to help parents and kids because of all that we're going through. And the first slide shows a soccer scene in Dear Me. And um, in this slide, the young boy is playing soccer. And then all of a sudden he's told, I've got to, he has to take some pictures for picture day. And what kid wants to stop playing soccer or playing at all to take pictures. So in this, he identifies, I am mad, which is great. He's identifying that emotion. Then we move on to the next slide in the book where we're using the strategy of journaling. It's concrete, real life, evidence back that we can journal through our emotions. We can manage our emotions. And so in that, he writes, dear me, it wasn't so bad. I having to take the picture. I got to dribble the ball while I waited in line. And now I'm going to have this picture for the rest of my life to remember my team. And so this is really important because what you're seeing is you're seeing the identification of that emotion, understanding it, then moving toward a strategy to get to a more positive emotion, but all the while feeling and, and, and managing those emotions. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about journaling as a part of this strategy. We know that mindful breathing works and journaling works. And so kids though, who are too young to write out dear me and that letter to themselves and love me, they can draw. We know through art therapy, we know that kids can draw about their emotions and feel better. And I have a story to share about when my son who's 13 now, Jackson, he was in preschool, and he was afraid to go to preschool. And what kid doesn't have those days where they just don't want to go to preschool? And he said to me, I'm afraid to go and make friends. And so what we did is we said, let's draw it out. So he, draw, he drew um, how he was feeling. And we said, let's also draw how you might feel if, if you feel good at school. And so he draw, drew a picture of himself getting out of my car and surrounded by friends and waving and he's happy. And so he would take this in the car with him as we went to school and he would look at it and remind himself that he's gonna be okay and he's gonna make some friends and then he'll see me after school. And so what we wanna do is we really wanna teach our kids to allow themselves to journal through drawing or writing or deep breathing that our kids can manage their emotions. So we recognize our emotions in oneself and in others. We understand the causes and the consequences of emotions. We label our emotions accurately. We really know, are we mad? Are we sad? What are we feeling? We express those emotions in an appropriate time and place. And we feel those, those emotions, we manage them. And then hopefully we move toward a more positive emotion. And so what does this develop? This develops self-love, self-compassion, self-regulation, self-advocacy. I can do this. I have the power to manage my emotions. I have the power. And that's what we want to give to our kids. And in this, these are all strategies toward better mental health. It's these seeds that we're planting, these strategies that we're giving to our kids that they can then have positive mental health later on in life and throughout life. And so we learn as parents and teachers that we can model this behavior and we can learn how to manage our emotions as well so that our kids can see that we can have this harmonious time at home and in school, it's up to us. So if we go back to the top of this question that I asked you, how are you feeling right now in this moment? Identifying that emotion for yourself is a gift to yourself, is a gift to our kids and being able to work through that. So I hope that if you had a negative emotion earlier on, that maybe later as you go through the day, you can help yourself manage your emotion and move through the day in a more peaceful and healthy way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Donna. And one of the things that you touched on that I really love 
is advocacy. And I think that's really difficult when you're dealing with emotions and so critical for children to be able to, especially children who are nonverbal, right? That's How right. is it using pictures? Is it using um, emoji faces so that they can identify where they are? Um, and then advocate, ask for help. I need help right now. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's critical. Thank you. And we have in, we'll be uploading a resource page um, where you can access Donna's book and podcast as well at the end of the session. And just a quick reminder, if you have any questions as we go, please put them in the chat and we will get to as many of them as possible. So thank you, Donna, very much. And we're gonna turn it over to Patrick Riley with Too Small to Fail, um, who will introduce our next panelist. Thank you so much, Marnie. It's so great to be with everyone here today. Uh, thank you so much to the Inclusion Matters team. Uh, we're always so delighted to partner with you, especially on such incredible and meaningful events like this. Um, so I have the distinct honor of introducing Dr. Frank Salio, um, who is our next expert panelist. Uh, Dr. Frank Salio is a New Jersey licensed psychologist and the founder and executive director of the Center for Psychological Enhancement in New Jersey. Um, Dr. Salio works with children, adolescents, adults, and families. He is the author of 12 award-winning children's books um, that have been translated into four languages, one of which we're gonna be very fortunate to hear soon, um, titled Be Calm, The Buzz of Yoga, published by APA's Imagination Press. Um, he is the author of a parenting book that addresses parenting chronic uh, medically ill children. Um, Dr. Salio speaks across the country and is published in numerous psychological journals. Um, we are just so honored and thankful to have um, Dr. Salio here to share some of his insights. I'll now pass it on to you. Great, thank you, Patrick. Welcome everyone, I'm glad to be here today and I'm glad you can join us. I'm really excited to share with you some tools that I use in my practice with kids um, on coping with stress and anxiety and worry. And I also wanna to talk to you about this construct called mindfulness. Whenever we're worried about something, I always advise my patients to make a plan because when we have a plan, it decreases the stress and the anxiety. It's why when we go for a job interview, we go for a dry run. We figure out what's the traffic light? Where am I going to park, et cetera. So when we have a plan, it reduces anxiety. So, but I think plan stands for something else. And this is something I talk about. Plan means putting life into action now. So not tomorrow, not next week, putting into action now. And hopefully the tools that, you know, when we're done today with this lunch and learn that maybe you're gonna start thinking about after listening to the speakers, what's my plan? How can I help myself? How can I help my kids, my students, et cetera, reduce stress and anxiety during this very difficult time? The idea of now is really, it leads right into mindfulness because we, we may or may not know what mindfulness is, but it basically means focusing on the now. Explaining it to children, I explain it as just noticing, noticing your thoughts, noticing your feelings, noticing your body sensations. We do know that if we live in the past, we think about what was, that's where remorse, regret, and depression live. If we think too much in the future, the what if thinker, then that's where anxiety lives. So if we live in the present, that's what is, we can help balance out some of those strong emotions. Breathing is an important component of mindfulness. And I'm gonna give you and talk to you about some tools that you can adapt to your kids, to your students and for yourself. So we're gonna create a coping toolbox. And think about if you hired a carpenter to work on your home and the carpenter shows up and they open up the toolbox and there's only a hammer in there. Pretty limited carpenter. So I wanna give you tools that perhaps you can impart to your kids or to yourself because what might work for one child may not work for another. And everything I'm speaking about is adaptable. And when we involve kids in creating coping toolboxes, we get a buy-in from them and they're more, more apt to using them. So what I've learned, and I've been a psychologist for over 25 years, and what I've 
what I've learned about working with kids and adults is that we like variety and choice. And in, in this world of the pandemic, our choices have been limited. Who wants to go to a restaurant where there's only one item on the menu? Not exactly a great restaurant. So choices are good. But more importantly, we want to make things fun for kids. Kids learn when it's fun. So I want to start with the toolbox. When I think about this, I want you to think about the three E's. Eat well, exercise, and ease into sleep. What I mean by ease into sleep is we know that blue lights on phones and tablets can cause problems of us sleeping. So maybe it means reading a story. Maybe it means taking a bubble bath. Maybe it means doing some breathing exercises. So just remember those three E's, eat well, exercise, and ease into sleep. When we think about breathing, it's a portable app. It's the best portable app we have. We take it everywhere and it's free. How many things can we say in life are free, right? So a couple of things I'm gonna show you that some of the things you can make at home, some things you may have to buy, but we're gonna start with this, this colorful ball called a Hoberman sphere. You can buy this on Amazon or in some toy store, but I call this the breathing ball. And I have these tools in my office behind, well, when I'm in doing sessions in person, but they're behind me to make kids curious about what is that? How do you use that? So we teach breathing by taking a deep breath in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. So it's colorful, it's tactile. Kids, kids like manipulatives. We can also create breathing beads. It's a pipe cleaner with beads and you tie it on on both ends and you hold it up, take a breath, breath in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And you can do this as many times as you like. And again, it doesn't cost a lot and it's a manipulative that kids can hold and make their own. The other thing is we can grab something called a pinwheel and we can take pinwheel breaths. So again, it's tactile, kids can hold it and take a deep breath in and they can see the pinwheel spin. The other thing that I create are called breath tubes. And there's two different sizes. One is a paper towel holder, one's a toilet paper holder. Now we know we've had a lot of these or hopefully had a lot of these during the pandemic, right? So, but the long tube you can, you can have kids decorate with, this is uh, wrapping paper, this is tin foil. You can have them decorate it every, any way they want. And the, the emphasis is on the exhale. So you use a long tube when you want to have a long exhale, they could feel their breath. But when you have a long extended exhale, it brings the energy down. So if you have a child who's dysregulating, who's freaking out, who's anxious, you want them to take a long exhale. Now say it's after lunch and everyone's feeling, you know, they, we're not gonna give our kids maybe Starbucks, right? So, so maybe we're, they need to bring their energy up. So the exhale has to be shorter. So we would use the toilet paper holder and blow out fast. And this works for adults too. So as after lunch, after, you know, after a, an, a, you know, a long day, we might wanna take shorter breaths or the shorter, the exhale being shorter. So these I call breath tubes and they're easy to make. And again, we have these kinds of materials in our home. So I want to, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, someone who is in three of my children's books and his name is Bentley. And this is Bentley, Bentley B. And he's a mindful B. And in one book, he does meditation. In one book that I'm gonna to read to you today, he does yoga. And in another book, he's, he does a special meditation called Loving Kindness, because we need loving kindness in our world today to teach kids to love one another and to spread kindness to each other. So Bentley does all that and he does yoga. And I'm going to read you a little bit about that. But yoga, if you're not familiar with yoga, is basically breathing and movement. It's mindfulness and motion. And some of the benefits of yoga, if you're not a yogi, is greater flexibility reduced stress, reduced anxiety, better focus, um, increased strength and overall well-being. So you don't have to be a pro at practicing yoga. And after I read my, my children's book, I'm going to show you three different poses that we can do together. Or if you don't wanna do it with me, just rehearse it in your mind. 
So let's read about Be Calm, The Buzz on Yoga, my children's book. Books are great ways to bond with children. And so this is a book that maybe you might read to your child. Be Calm, The Buzz on Yoga. Bentley B lives in a hive in a beautiful place with colorful flowers and open space. He loves to fly around and visit friends too. From up above, he has a bee's eye view. One day it was warm with bright sunlight, the perfect day to go for a flight. First, Bentley flew to the top of the hill. There was Pat Possum standing still. Pat, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? I'm doing yoga. This is mountain pose. Give it a try. No, thanks, said Bentley. Yoga looks strange to me. Anyway, I've got other friends to go see. Next, Bentley went to visit his pal, Bernie Bunny. He was standing in a way that looked kind of funny. Bernie was squatting like he was in a chair, but there was nothing underneath him. He was sitting on air. I'm doing yoga, said Bernie. This is called chair pose. I balance my body and breathe through my nose. Bentley flew on to the evergreen tree and saw Jane Blue Jay. Bewildered, he asked, why are you standing that way? This is a yoga pose called airplane. It helps me concentrate, said Jane. Then something caught Bentley's eye. He couldn't help but stare. Freddy Fox was in the grass with his tail in the air. Bentley was curious. What is this pose called, Freddy? Downward dog, he replied as he tried to be steady. Bentley flew on. He saw Abby Ant on a rose. She was also in an unusual pose. That pose looks fun. Could you teach it to me? Of course, said Abby. This pose is called tree. Put your foot below your knee, Abby said. Place your hands by your chest or over your head. Bentley tried to balance his body. He began to wiggle. I'm a tree, he said, and he started to giggle. I like this pose, said Bentley, but what's all the buzz? What is yoga? I'm still not sure what it does. Yoga exercises the body and mind. It helps me focus, feel calm and unwind. The practice of yoga began a long time ago. Give it a try, be patient and go slow. Yoga should feel good, so don't push or strain. Stop what you're doing if you feel any pain. Bentley tried other poses. He felt unsure. He kept an open mind and tried some more. He learned warrior, child, and cobra pose too. The more he practiced, the more he could do. Soon Bentley was doing yoga alone with friends whenever he could. Although it could be tricky, it made him feel good. Now, once a day, Bentley takes a yoga break. Afterward, he feels peaceful, refreshed, and awake. So practice like Bentley, find a quiet place, do a pose, take a deep breath and see how it goes. You've learned the buzz on yoga. Your practice has begun. Be gentle with yourself. Remember to have fun. The end. So I'd like to just show you three quick poses and I'm gonna, you could do them standing or you can do them sitting. I'm gonna do them sitting. So we're gonna do mountain pose like Pat Possum did in the book. So you can start by just sitting comfortably in the chair. If you wanna put your feet on the floor to feel the ground, you can put your hands next to you. 
and just look up to the sky. Take a deep breath in and breathe out slowly. And you can do that several times. Or you could do tree pose in the same position. And this time, just raise your arms up, reach your branches up to the sky, stretch, but don't strain. Take a deep breath in and release. And you could do that several times. And lastly, it's something called an easy pose. Basically sitting upright as best as you can and give yourself a hug and give yourself a twist. Turn to the right and turn to the left. Don't forget to breathe. Breathing is really important when it comes to yoga. And these are things that you can practice with kids and you can get them to engage with you in the practice of yoga and in mindfulness and in breathing. I thank you for this opportunity to share this toolbox with you. And I hope that you can create a toolbox with your children. Thank you so much, Dr. Salia, for sharing such meaningful messages um, within Be Calm and just, I love all the toolkit strategies. I know I am probably gonna do some yoga today. Uh, so just thank you so much for all your insights and sharing your wisdom. Um, it is now my um, honor again to introduce another one of our incredible panelists, um, Dr. Marian Afanadu. Um, Dr. Afanadu is a director of training at Maryland Center for Development of Disabilities, um, Kennedy Krieger Institute. Dr. Afanadu is a distinguished researcher, clinician, and professor. Dr. Afanadu served as the project director of an NIH-funded clinical trial on early parenting intervention comparison research study at the Center for Child and Family Traumatic Stress at Kennedy Krieger Institute, and is the founder and clinical director of the Family um, Counseling Center. Um, she currently holds faculty positions at Johns Hopkins University and the University of Maryland. Um, she has published several peer-reviewed journal articles and, has ser and serves on several boards and committees related to psychology, social work, and supporting children with disabilities. Um, Dr. Afanadu, we are so honored and humbled to have you join us today, and we are really looking forward to all the insights that you will share with us. Um, so I will now pass it along to you, Dr. Afanadu. Thank you so much, Patrick. It is really great to be here today and to be a part of this beautiful community that is gathered here today. We all know that community is what makes us stronger. And thank you, Dr. Silos, for such wonderful tips that you've provided to us, including the yoga poses. When we feel included, our life and the lives of those around us does flourish. I was asked to talk about supporting mental health, particularly social inclusion of children with developmental disabilities. And I think building off of what my colleagues has shared, I'm gonna take a different angle now with this is really a good reminder for all of us to really understand the needs of each individual, especially the needs of our children with developmental disabilities. So dear friends, I really call on you right now to take a quick imagination activity journey with me. You can close your eyes if you want, or just kind of, if you're comfortable doing so, if not, just relax and just follow along. But I want you to imagine that you just woke up and you found yourself in another world, all by yourself. No single soul is present. You look everywhere and you could not find anyone, just you. How would you feel? How long do you think you will last before you start losing your mind? I welcome you to use the chat box to post how you will feel and how long do you think you would last before you start going I don't know where I am and what I'm doing. I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Cast Away by Tom Hanks, a man who was stranded on a, a deserted island. And he lasted for four years, only finding comfort in an ordinary vulnerable. So as you post how you feel, if somebody said one week, frightened, not sure, alone, scared, confused. So keep posting that. So just a lot of negative feelings and this feeling of, I wanna get out, I wanna be with someone. So as we talk about social inclusion, 
what we need to understand is that we humans are interactional beings. We hate to be alone. As evidence to what you are all posting in the chat box now. This is why it's very important for us to really make the mental health and social inclusion of children and youth with disability a priority. As we all know, social inclusion does matter. There's no two ways about it. It serves as a protective factor for our children with disability. It is an important avenue for them to achieve psychological well-being. It also does promote mental health and a person's dignity. All of us, we need a sense of belongingness, right? These are all human needs, basic human rights that we are called to make sure that every single one of us is able to deliver. Social inclusion also allows us to celebrate neurodiversity. When we celebrate our differences and our abilities, we feel good. It is our differences and our uniqueness that binds us together as humans. So in everything that we do, including where we find ourselves now, we need to keep this in mind, that everyone comes with a different strength. Everyone brings different gifts and different abilities to the table. Social inclusion is what allows us to connect together and sustain our humanity. It is only when we learn to celebrate what each of us bring, that's when we can have a world that is much better. That's when we can truly celebrate diversity. Only when we also feel the power of social inclusion, that's when we can be able to recognize that social exclusion has no power or space in where we are. Now, as we think about the pandemic and we think about our individuals and children, especially with disabilities, we know that this pandemic has truly brought about more loneliness, more social isolation, a sense of fear and anxiety for all of us. This physical distancing and quarantine measures that we have currently in place is triggering a lot of behavior problems, right? And it's adding to the impact on mental health for our children. Many of them are now struggling in public spaces if they are able to get to public spaces. These health measures in place, including the use of PPE, our kids are needing extra support to learn how to use those. They're also struggling with changes in routine. And as we know, most of our kids really don't like disruption in their daily activities. The opportunity for them to continue to learn and develop these important social and behavioral skills has been limited. Some of them are even experiencing regression to old and unwanted behaviors. Our parents are reporting that they are not able to fully return. This idea of not being able to really maintain a regular family activity is very disruptive to their health and to their family routine, especially with caring for a child with disability. We know that I was asked to give strategies. And again, every single person is unique and brings something different to the table. But I want to give you four C's. I know Dr. Silos, you offer three, and I have four <laughs> that I need to offer. So I will call on you to think about four C's to effective advocacy. They include confidence, competency, connection, and collaboration. And for the sake of time, I am going to organize all four into three themes, self-awareness, building resilience, as well as building collaborative support systems. So the first one to inclusive practice is really self-awareness because through self-reflection, parents, educators, providers, all of us can begin to really help to tap into our own inner core, which helps us build this confidence. It is important to always check in with ourselves, right? To examine the biases we are carrying and our attitude, especially when it comes to inclusive practice, especially working with our families and children with disabilities. We need to recognize our own individual identity. And what I mean by identity is that the relationship your identity has, the power, and the oppression, and you want to use this power that it comes with to begin to help you get an understanding that will help you 
foster equity and respect for our children and youths, especially those from underrepresented communities. We must always challenge ourselves to engage in difficult and honest conversation about our individual differences. That is the self-awareness that I want you to call to always remember. The next one is building resilience. You and I will agree that every child with or without disability has strengths, right? And they bring unique talents to the table. I encourage you to draw from your competency. That's the second C. Your human capital, which are your skills and your knowledge that you have as a parent and as an educator to help you now begin to build on our students and our children's strengths. I call on you to teach a model self-regulation and you've heard a lot of examples about how to go about doing that. And also effective coping for our children. They learn by watching us, they are copycats. So we need to really watch our behaviors and the choices we are making around them, especially during these difficult times. I call on you to try to maintain structure by having scheduled learning times is very important. And also to maintain routine by finding new ways to begin to do all things. It is important to also provide our children with activities that are oriented to their strengths and to their abilities. Those that are person-centered and that respect their unique differences. When we engage and provide our children with opportunities for meaningful social educational participation, everyone wins. So I encourage you to always practice including self-care so that you can be fully present. Taking this deep breathing, not only teaching a child, but also teaching yourself as well to do so. If, when you are able to really be fully present, you are better able to support our children. My office recently put together a resource guide on caring for yourself while you're caring for others. And I think I shared a link with Ms. Norris, who's going to uh, post that link for you in the chat box. We must also dismantle this belief that only professionals or people with formal training can better interact with or assist our children with disabilities. Parents, I encourage you to come together as well. So I will call on you to really, this last point I'm going to offer you is on building collaborative support system. I encourage you to draw from your social capital this time around to make connection. So I talked about the human capital, which is your skills, what you have. Now your social capital is who you know, the connections that you make. But this connection needs to be meaningful connection. And we know connections that are meaningful are built on meaningful relationships. So I call on you to please build on and maintain systems of strong support for our children. Parents, I encourage you to keep the line of communication between your children's school, your job, the family, keep those open so that you can work collaboratively with others as you advocate for your children. Now, our educators and providers, I call on you to please remember that it's very important to establish a collaborative and sustaining relationship with our parents. They are now serving as learning coaches at home, they are the ones who are barrier nurses to prevent inpatient admission. They have a lot on their shoulder at this point. So it is important to meet them where they are and also to initiate the contact to meet with them regularly because you need their input and support. It's also critical to ensure that parents, you have the space to help our parents learn to be able to have some kind of workable level of IT literacy giving the telemedicine that we are providing now and academics learning online uh, for the student. It is also important for you to collaborate with other social institutions and disability organizations. This will definitely ensure that coordinated actions and provision of equity-based services for our children are in place. We know that individual family and structural level social exclusions are harmful. Right, so let us stop working in silos. I call on you all. Let us channel our efforts together because we are only stronger together. Let us advocate for safe shared spaces 
and opportunities that will empower our children with disabilities and to promote their health, mental health and wellness. We know that inclusion matters because our children are too small to be failed. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Afanadu. Um, thank you. Thank you. And we have the, in the resource page that we're providing at the end of this, um, there's a wonderful article that Dr. Afanadu wrote on social inclusion um, that she's given us permission to share. So that's going to be a great guide as well. Um, so for our very last panelist, we have the honor of introducing Dr. Michelle Borba. Um, she's an educational psychologist, an internationally renowned speaker, educator, um, best-selling author, as well as a Today Show contributor um, who blends 40 years of teaching and consulting experience with the latest in research to offer realistic sound advice for parents, educators, caregivers on how to help our children thrive. So Dr. Borba, thank you for being here and we're gonna have her take it away. I'm just so delighted and honored to be here. What a panel, thank you so much. And I get to be the concluder, so there we go. Uh, there isn't one of us out there that isn't concerned about our kids. We now know that the next mental health crisis along the way is going to be a youth mental health crisis. It's been an unprecedented time, but maybe there's one little moment along the way that's this reset button for parents and educators that realize our kids need more than a GPA. It's a very uncertain world and not a pandemic. What else is coming down the pike? Who knows? What I've been trying to figure out actually for 40 years, I'm a kind of a late bloomer here, is why do some kids struggle and others shine? And I think that there is some extraordinary research in the field of resilience that somehow has been kind of undercover. So I wanna take a moment to look at it and then say, here's some simple little things we can do. Uh, you're hearing some extraordinary speakers today. I think the most important thing is we walk away here with one or two things that we can actually do with our kids. When I tried to figure out why some children are more likely to bounce back, I took extraordinary pieces of research from Annie Warner to Ann Maston to Norm Gormizki to Ron Michael Rudder. They're actually been looking at cohorts of kids for a long, long time. And they took kids who really were facing extreme adversity, war-torn areas, homelessness, poverty, mental health of their parents, schizophrenic parents. And along the way, what I discovered is that really strong children have learned some protective strategies. In fact, the thing that resilient kids have in common is number one, they already have a you in their life. It's a caring adult, a champion who refuses to give up with a kid who's there for them and who's calm. But the second thing I discover is there's seven strengths. So let's just take a moment to look at the seven strengths and then let's look at, so how do we start to teach these with our kids? When I looked at all of the research, I, I wanted to find out only ones that are teachable that aren't locked into DNA. And there are ones that not only impact resilience, also mental health, but also peak performance in a classroom. That's where I came up with seven. And by the way, the last three speakers have already talked about these. It starts with confidence. So you have a strong understanding of my strengths, not my deficits, who I am, because strengths help a child endure. Strength area is a child who goes, I got this, because when adversity hits, I have a strong understanding of who I am, not what my parent wants me to be. Second, you've heard inclusion, you've heard empathy. And we realize that social distancing of a year has made a lot of us feel not only lonely, but watch our mental health needs rise. We need connection, we need each other because thrivers think we, not me. And we're gonna help our kids learn to how to reconnect because social skills need to be practiced just like exercising, we need to exercise our social skill muscles. By the way, the three most highly correlated ones you can teach your kid right now. Keep saying hello, let's wave. We don't, that's okay if they can't see our smile. We can just wave. Eye contact, don't look down, look up. You actually will be taking a lot more seriously if you don't look down. Always look at the color of the talker's eyes. You can teach that at age two. And encourage, get out the shoots and ladders game. It's thumbs up, it's high five, good job. Start exercising those and your child will feel a lot safer when he finally goes back into those classroom doors and sees each other. You've heard a lot on the third one, self-control. The mindfulness is absolutely powerful. Donna talked a lot about not only empathy, but also self-control. To being able to give yourself permission to have feelings is essential for both. 
integrity. I love the fact that kids who have thriving abilities know what they stand for. They have a strong moral code. Parents keep telling your kids what you stand for. Because when mental adversity comes, a thriver is a kid who says, I got this and doesn't have to wiver and waver. Also curiosity. Oh, these are children who aren't helicoptered. In fact, the strongest correlation of a child who is a thriver is they have personal agency or self-efficacy. They're not helicoptered or rescued. This is the kid who says, I got this because we've helped the child when they come running in from a home, sit down and say, take a deep breath, sweetie pie. Thanks for telling me what's bugging you. Now let's brainstorm what else you could do differently next time. They're problem solvers and then they can persevere. They don't quit, they don't give up, but you can't just teach them perseverance. What I discovered along the way is that these strengths also have a multiplier effect. Every parent, you're also gonna say, oh my gosh, does he have to have all seven? No, it's a rare parent who has all seven. But the more you have, the better. Because if empathy and self-control together, oh, that creates a change maker. You have confidence and perseverance, you got a flow state and you won't stop. Optimism is the last one. You got a sense of hope about your life. And as a result, you keep the pessimism down. I think what we need to keep in mind is that we've gone through a year of doom and gloom. And so what I wanna zero in on is that last one. How do you help kids find hope in a year of gloom? How do you help them find a silver lining? I don't wanna raise a Pollyanna. You gotta have a reality check. All of these are in the book called Thrivers. Each chapter is one of those with dozens of simple science-backed ways but let's just take a moment, pick up a pencil, and let's talk about how do you raise an optimistic child? I think the first thing is we get into the shoes of our kid and we realize it's been a doom and gloom world. I think the first thing we've got to realize is the research is saying is the more our kids see the doom and gloom stuff from George Floyd dying live to mass shootings, to watch the TV and it's a daily death count of how many people have passed away today. After a while, that does a number to you as well as the child. So here's the first thing, monitor the news, turn it off. Here's another thing that I think is absolutely wonderful. We do know that images either elevate our empathy or take us down. Empathy is a superpower. It helps us realize, hey, I can do something to make a difference in the world if we think we. So here's one little thing you can do. There's incredible good stuff, but it's in the back page of the newspaper. Cut it out. In fact, you're better if you show kids the newspaper as opposed to the images that are live. That's why those reporters always say, in the next few minutes, we caution you because it's gonna be very dismal stuff you're seeing and it could be very damaging to you. There's a thought, turn it off. Instead, cut out the good stuff. Do what Fred Rogers would say. Help your kid find the helper so they don't have this doom and gloom of the world. I actually cut them out and put them on good news reports. Talk to your kids right before they go to bed. What a great way to reduce the nightmares. Or every night around the dinner hour. Here's one more kid I found. Real stories about real kids they inspire. Well, like these two kids from Ohio, a brother and a sister who were really concerned, here comes empathy, with the 78-year-old neighbor who was so lonely all by herself down the street living in that house. Mom, we got to do something for her. Imagine how you'd feel. There's empathy. But also the mother said, what do you think you could do? There's efficacy. Well, we know our strengths. There's self-confidence. We can bring our cellos down to her porch. Maybe we can give a little cello concert for her, Mom. Maybe that would make her feel good. Bless the mom, because she says, go for it, sweetie pie. The kids took their cellos down. They gave the concert. But you know what else mom did? She did it with it. She put it on Facebook, and it went viral. It went viral, and who began the copycats? Other kids across the country. That's why you're seeing ukulele concerts in Sacramento by 13-year-olds. That's why you're seeing tuba concerts by 10-year-olds over in New York. Kids need to be inspired. And the first way you can reduce that pessimism and open up that hope is by showing them the good news of the world. Number two, one of the most amazing things I've had the honor to do is work on overseas army bases on training ASACs counselors on how to help kids in trauma. But most amazing thing I got to do when I was there is talk to Navy SEALs, the most elite forces in the world. And they said, hey, we're retraining ourselves on how to keep our arousal control up. Some of it was the mindful breathing you just heard but they do one other little thing. They said, what we do, what you've got to help your kids do is identify their stress signs. 
They come before the meltdown and every kid has their own unique one. Maybe this week to help your kid learn to cope, don't just point to the kid who's irritable. Everybody in the family's got their own unique one. Ask your kid what yours are. My kids would tell me, the iron before I get mad, mom, you do that weird thing with your eyes. They know our signs, help them learn what their signs are. Some kids it's like this, other kids their little feet go up. And all you need to do is politely say, looks like you're getting a little stressed. You know, your body is giving you an anger warning sign. Now what do I do? Well, you can take the deep, slow breath that you've learned, but you can also do another thing. Navy SEALs say they learn a positive refrain that they say inside their head, like, I got this. It's okay. I can get through it. Parents start doing that tonight. And you don't have to teach it immediately to your child. The best way to teach any skill is by modeling it. So model it to your child. Pretend you're frustrated. Oh, wow. I'm getting upset. I got this. I'll get through it. If you keep saying a mantra loud enough, pretty soon the glorious part of parenting comes through. Your voice becomes your child's inner voice. Oh my gosh, he'll use that the rest of his life and that's what you're looking for. How about one other little thing? Your kids right now, and many of them told me they're scared to death, they're gonna catch that virus. Well, all they've been watching is a doom and gloom report and frankly, some of them have been watching some horrible things happening. Maybe a grandparent's passed away or a best friend has passed away. So what do you do? You don't talk your child out of a fear, it's real. But instead what you do is just like you used to do when your kid was afraid of the swimming pool. You don't throw them in the deep end, you chunk the fear. Instead, what you do is, let's put your toe in today. Oh, looks like you're okay, sweetie pie. Okay, now let's next day put, your, put your, your knee in. Next day, you finally help your child learn to adapt and give some hope. You do the same with a virus. Thank you for telling me that you're scared of that virus. I know that sounds really real to you. So today, let's open up the window. Looks like you're okay tomorrow. Let's now open up the door. Looks like you're okay. Let's put your foot out. Let's walk to the mailbox. Chunk the fear into manageable dosages. You see, there's lots of ways you can instill hope in a child. One of the things that, <laughs> this is precious, but I always Zoom with kids all the time with focus groups of teenagers. And I was focusing with a group of very high peak performing Chicago kids and I said, Okay, tell me the book you wish every high school teacher would be reading to you right now. What do kids need? I bet you this is a $50,000 question. You'll never get it. They said, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. I said, you're kidding. I said, no, that's what every kid needs to hear right now. Start reading. That's Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Chicken Little. Ah, oh, the other one is Terrible. Today was a Terrible Day. Help kids know that it's going to be okay. Tomorrow's going to be a better day. Fortunately, by Remy Charlotte, we read that when our kids were little. Keep telling them. Every day, Ned has an unfortunate, but that's okay because the next page, he turns his unfortunate into a fortunate. One of the things we do for trauma children, we do know that if you put a crisis in perspective, it can help a child. So one of the things you can do, not to all kids, you can't do all of these things for every kid. You gotta find what resonates for the child. But maybe if it's a child is really scared of the virus, thank you for telling me. Let's look at history. Let's look at back in history. Oh, let's look at what happened in the Spanish flu. Wow, they did the same thing right there. It seems like they were wearing masks. Seems like they couldn't go out to restaurants, but look what happened. They got through it. Ebola, smallpox, polio. Put it in perspective. You see what I'm, I'm helping, I hope you see, is that hope can be instilled in children. It isn't with one little activity. It's with us modeling hope to our kids. It's by giving them what science says are simple little things to instill hope. Thrivers has dozens of ideas. Don't you dare do dozens of ideas or your kid will never let you read a book as long as you live. Don't do all those things, mom. Choose one and keep doing it over and over again until that is a strategy that your child can use without you. That's what we're trying to do is help our kids thrive, not by us rescuing them, by giving them agency though they have tools on their own. One final little thing, we've been talking a lot, a lot of stuff about what to do for kids. Uh, I was writing Thrivers and I remember interviewing this fabulous journalist, she was about 85, and I said to her, hey, you know what? You were raised in London during, during a pretty tough time, during the Blitz, during World War II. How did you endure that? 
every night with air raid sirens going off, every night hearing the bombings, every night hearing the planes coming in, every morning waking up to your whole, whole city being desecrated. And I remember her looking at me and all of a sudden she goes, I never thought of it that way. And I said, what do you mean? You never thought of the blitz? She says, no, because I don't remember that. I said, what do you remember? She says, I do remember the signs of the air raid sirens. But the moment the air raid sirens came in, I remember my grandparents pulling the black shades because we had to have the drape skull so that there weren't any lights. And then I remember them starting to sing. And I remember what we used to do is sing Ring Around the Rosie. We'd sing all these games. We'd play the whole time. We never heard the air raid sirens. What we did instead was watch my calm grandparents sing. I think that's the bottom line for us. We can get through this, we will. Yeah, our kids are troubled and so are we. But the two things that keep coming up in resilience, it's teachable, drivers are made, not born, is one, they have learned protective factors along the way. You've been hearing those all day long. You've been hearing fabulous ideas. There's dozens of them that we've just presented to you. Find one that's gonna work for your family. Do the same one for at least 21 days until it becomes a habit. Your kids can do it without you, then add the next one. But remember the bottom line to it all, ordinary things do make extraordinary differences in children's lives, like reading, like sense of humor, like mindful breathing, over and over again. But the bottom line to every child who endures and gets through this is a calm, caring, champion parent who refuses to give up on the child. Be that for your kid and we'll get through this together. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Borba. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And one thing that occurred to me because I have a 17 year old is as a parent, it's never too late to learn. <laughs> you, you know, some of those things I did practice, some I didn't. But you know, that, that constant seeking and learning as a parent, as an educator, it's never too late to yeah. learn new tools. So thank you. Um, so much. Thank you all of you for being here. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Tiffany Harris and Jane Park to close us out. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I personally am so grateful for this hour that we were able to spend with uh, all of our experts Thank you so much for your generosity of spirit and coming together here today. I know there's a million things going on in all of your lives and you decided to contribute to this hour for all of us and I couldn't be more grateful. And I, I realize sometimes it's very hard to encapsulate everything you know in, in 10 minutes time and the truth is we could fill you know, a, a two-day session, uh, a week session with everything that you know collectively. And um, so I really encourage everyone who's on here to um, take a look at the resource page. Uh, all of our panelists have contributed to that resource page and uh, you can dive deeper into their knowledge um, through those various links. And um, thank you, thank you so much. And I look forward to uh, looking at all of the resources and to learning more, as Marnie said, you're, you know, I have a 17 year old and I have a 21 year old and um, there's such great information today for me, for them and for all of us. So thank you so much. And uh, I will pass it over to Jane. Great. Thank you so much. I think wow is the word of the day. And just thank you um, just from the bottom of my heart and just on behalf of all of us at um, Too Small to Fail, just for just all of our incredible speakers, um, just for everything that you shared. Um, if you have one strategy that you just, you know, is top of mind for you, would you mind just putting it into the chat box so we can do a little bit of a recap? But if there's one strategy that just really resonated with you. It would be great if you can share it in the chat box. It'd be great to, to read just kind of what, um, what really stood out for you. I think you know, what, what um, as, a, as a mom, I have an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. So being a part of this wasn't just helpful, um, but emotional as well. You know, we've lost, um, we lost a family member due to COVID. 
um, haven't been able to see close relatives and, and friends out on the West Coast. Um, we're in the East Coast now for over a year juggling work and school and not even meeting teachers. Um, you know, so it's just, um, it's been challenging. So just grateful um, personally to all of our speakers. What also struck me was that so much of the strategy shared um, today by our experts are rooted in conversations and just to creating space to talk together about emotions and expressing feelings and creating, you know, even though they're not, they may not all be good feelings that, that, that it's okay. And that's an important conversation that I've been having with my children as well. And, and just that ordinary moments can be extraordinary. Um, just so those simple daily moments. And I uh, just wanna thank all of you for, for just all of those strategies that you shared. Um, as some of you were talking, I was reminded me of a. Uh, I was reminded of a great friend, Veronica Tapia, who's actually here today. She's a parent advisor of Too Small to Fail, a dear friend of mine, and my daughter's former preschool teacher. Who I just I'll never forget when she shared a story about um, how she just wakes up trying to make each day special for her two children. You know, even though there's nowhere to go, how can we make each day special and bring joy? And uh, I, I just I, I I think about Veronica and just the way that um, she creates space for conversation, for discovery, for, for mistakes, for learning. Um, and I think we're all on a learning journey together. So we're very grateful. With that um, said, I will read a quote by Fred Rogers, who as I mentioned him before is one of my heroes. And I hadn't actually read this one until someone shared it with me um, <clears throat> recently, but just wanna end here. Uh, with this quote, we need to remember that children are trying to, trying to understand their feelings and their world, trying to please the people they love, trying to grow up. And when grownups and children are trying together, just about anything is possible. Um, so thank you for, um, for being great teachers to me, um, for being great teachers to all of us and, and all those who will continue to watch this recording even after this moment. Um, and that uh, it just, I think there's beauty in us just trying our best together every day. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. We will be back next month with another um, Lunch and Learn. So please stay tuned. We will also be emailing the recording as well as the resource page after we are finished here today. And thank you all for being here. It's, it really is a great community of people who are stretching, striving, trying, making mistakes, but always striving to create a more inclusive, loving and nurturing environment for our children. So thank you so much. And we can't wait for you to look at all those resources in the resource page, please, please do. And we'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Tuesday.